Good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for coming together to join in words of Torah, in relationships of Torah, and sharing both with one another. We are in Parshat Kititse, which you can find in the book of Numbers, uh, beginning with chapter 21, verse 10. Deuteronomy. Yes, Deuteronomy uh, chapter 21, verse 10. And if you'd like to go ahead and unmute, together we can recite our blessing for this wonderful opportunity of sharing for with one another. Baruch Ata Adonai Thank you, God, for this wonderful opportunity of immersing ourselves in words, deeds, and relationships of Torah. We will share in the reading of the English translation of our Torah portion, and then I'll share with you a focused study about this week's portion, and then we'll open it up so everyone can have an opportunity to share his or her reflections on the weekly portion. Let me share with you the opening verses, beginning at chapter, 10, uh, chapter 21, verse 10. When you will go out to war against your enemies, and Adonai, your God, will deliver them into your hand, and you will capture their captivity, and you will See among the captivity a woman who is beautiful of form, and you desire her, you may take her to yourself for a wife. You shall bring her to the midst of your house. She shall shave her head and let her nails grow. She shall remove the garment of her captivity from upon herself and sit in your house, and she will weep for her father and her mother for a full month. Thereafter, you may come to her and live with her, and she shall be a wife to you. But it shall be that if you do not desire her, then you shall send her on her own. But you may not sell her for money. You shall not enslave her because you have afflicted her. Dave, would you like to read a little bit there beginning at verse 15? Okay. If a man has two wives, one loved and the other unloved, and both the loved and the unloved have borne him sons, but the firstborn is the son of the unloved one, when he wills his property to his sons, he may not treat as firstborn the son of the loved one in disregard of the son of the unloved one who is older. Instead, he must accept the firstborn, the son of the unloved one, and allot to him a double portion of all he possesses, since he is the first fruit of his vigor, the birthright is his due. If a man has a wayward and defiant son who does not heed his father or mother, and does not obey them even after they discipline him, his father and mother shall take hold of him and bring him out to the elders of the town at the public place of his community. They shall say to the elders of the town, this son of ours is disloyal and defiant. Uh, he does not heed us. He is a glutton and a drunkard. I got that off here. Thereupon, sorry, thereupon the men of his town shall stone him to death. Thus you will sweep out evil from your midst. All of Israel will hear and be afraid. If a man is guilty of a capital offense and is put to death, and you impale him on a stake, you must not let his corpse remain on the stake overnight, but must bury him the same day. For an impaled body is an affront to God. You shall not defile the land that the Lord your God is giving you to possess. 
Thank you so much, Dave. Robin, would you like to read a little bit beginning at the start of chapter 22? Yes, thank you, Rabbi. If you see your fellow Israelites ox or sheep gone astray, do not ignore it. You must take it back to your peer. If your fellow Israelite does not live near you or you do not know who the owner is, you shall bring it home and it shall remain with you until your peer claims it. Then you shall give it back. You shall do the same with that person's ass. You shall do the same with that person's garment. And so too shall you do with anything that your fellow Israelite loses and you find. You must not remain indifferent. If you see your fellow Israelites ass or ox fallen on the road, do not ignore it. You must raise it together. A woman must not put on man's apparel, nor shall a man wear woman's clothing. For whoever does these things is abhorrent to Adonai your God. If along the road you chance upon a bird's nest in any tree or on the ground with fledglings or eggs and the mother sitting over the fledglings or on the eggs, do not take the mother together with her young. Let the mother go and take only the young in order that you may fare well and have a long life. When you build a new house, you shall make a parapet for your roof so that you do not bring blood guilt on your house if anyone should fall from it. You shall not sow your vineyard with a second kind of seed, else the crop from the seed you have sown and the yield of the vineyard may not be used. You shall not plow with an ox and an ass together. You shall not wear clothing combining wool and linen. You shall make tassels on the four corners of the garment with which you cover yourself. Thank you, Robin, so much. Let me invite Barry, would you like to continue there at uh, verse 13? Okay, uh, as soon as I turn the page here. A man marries a woman and cohabits with her. Then he takes an aversion to her and makes up charges against her and defames her saying, I married this woman, but when I approached her, I found that she was not a virgin. In such a case, the girl's father and mother shall produce the evidence of the girl's virginity before the elders of the town at the gate. And the girl's father shall say to the elders, I gave this man my daughter to wife, but he has taken an aversion to her. So he has made up charges saying, I did not find your daughter a virgin, but here is the evidence of my daughter's virginity. And they shall spread out the cloth before the elders of the town. The elders of that town shall then take the man and flog him and they shall find him a hundred shekels of silver and give it to the girl's father for the man has defamed a virgin in Israel. Moreover, she shall remain his wife. He shall never have the right to divorce her. But if the charges prove true, the girl was found not to have been a virgin. Then the girl shall be brought out to the entrance of her father's house and the men of the town shall stone her to death. For she did a shameful thing in Israel, being fortification while under her father's authority. Thus you will sweep away evil from your midst. If a man is found lying with another man's wife, both of them, the man and the woman with whom he lay, shall die. Thus you will sweep away evil from Israel. In the case of a virgin who is engaged to a man, if a man comes upon her in town and lies with her, you shall take the two of them out to the gate of that town and stone them to death. The girl, because she did not cry for help in the town, and the man, because he has violated his neighbor's wife. Thus you shall sweep away evil from your midst. But if the man comes upon the engaged girl in the open country, and the man lies with her by force, only the man who lay with her shall die. But you shall do nothing to the girl. The girl did not incur the death penalty, for this case is like that of a man attacking another and murdering him. He came upon her in the open. Though the engaged girl cried for help, there was no one to save her. If a man comes upon a virgin who is not engaged and he seizes her or lies with her and they are discovered, the man who lay with her shall pay the girl's father 50 shekels of silver and she shall be his wife because he has violated her. 
he can never have the right to divorce her. Thank you, Harry. Now, Cheryl, uh, would you like would you like to share uh, some readings at the start of chapter twenty three? Thank you, Rabbi. No householder shall marry his father's former wife so as to remove his father's garment. No man whose testes are crushed or whose member is cut off shall be admitted into the congregation of Adonai. No one misbegotten shall be admitted into the congregation of Adonai. No descendant of such, even in the 10th generation, shall be admitted into the congregation of Adonai. No Ammonite or Moabite shall be admitted into the congregation of Adonai. No descendants of such, even in the 10th generation, shall ever be admitted into the congregation of Adonai, because they did not meet you with food and water on your journey after you left Egypt, and because they hired Balaam, son of Beor, from Pethor of Aramaharim, to curse you. But your god Adonai refused to heed he Balaam. Instead, your god Adonai turned the curse into a blessing for you, for your god Adonai loves you. You shall never concern yourself with their welfare or benefit as long as you live. You shall not abhor an Edomite, for such is your kin. You shall not abhor an Egyptian, for you were a stranger in that land. Children born to them may be admitted into the congregation of Adonai in the third generation. When you go out as a troop against your enemies, be on your guard against anything untoward. If anyone among you has, tendered imp has been tendered impure by a nocturnal emission, he must leave the camp and he must not re-enter the camp. Toward evening he shall bathe in water, and at sundown he may re-enter the camp. Further, there shall be an area for you outside the camp where you may relieve yourself. With your gear you shall have a spike, and when you have squatted, you shall dig a hole with it and cover up your excrement. Since your god Adonai moves about in your camp to protect you and to deliver your enemies to you, let your camp be holy. Let God not find anything unseemly among you and turn away from you. Thank you so much, Cheryl. Let me invite Mark Thompson. Would you like to read a little bit there, beginning at verse 16? And you'll have to unmute, Mark. There. Better? Yes. All right. 16. You shall not turn over to his master, a slave who seeks refuge with you from his master. He shall live with you in any place he may choose among the settlements in your midst. Wherever he pleases, you must not ill-treat him. No Israelite woman shall be a cult prostitute, nor shall any Israelite man be a cult prostitute. You shall not bring the fee of a whore or pay of a dog into the house of Adonai your God in fulfillment of any vow for both are abhorrent to Adonai, your God. You shall not deduct interest from loans to your countrymen, whether in money or food or anything else that can be deducted as interest. But you may deduct interest from loans to foreigners. Do not deduct interest from loans to your countrymen so that Adonai, your God, may bless you in all your undertakings in the land that you are about to enter and possess. When you make a vow to Adonai, your God, do not put off fulfilling it. For Adonai, your God, will require it of you, and you will have incurred guilt, whereas you incur no guilt if you refrain from vowing. You must fulfill what has crossed your lips and perform what you have voluntarily vowed to Adonai, your God, having made the promise with your own mouth. When you enter another man's vineyard, you may eat as many grapes as you want until you are full, but you must not put any in your vessel. When you enter another man's field of standing grain, you may pluck ears with your hand, but you must not put a sickle to your neighbor's grain. Thank you so much. David and Susan, would you like to read a little bit at the start of chapter 24? Yes, thank you, Rabbi. When a man takes a wife and beds her, it shall be if she does not find favor in his eyes because he finds in her some shamefully exposed thing and he writes her a document of divorce and puts it in her hand and sends her away from his house and she goes out from his house and goes and becomes another man's and the second man hates her and writes her a document of divorce and puts it in her hand and sends her away from his home 
or the second man who took her to him as wife dies, her first husband who sent her away shall not be able to come back and take her to be his wife after she has been defiled, for it is an abhorrence before the Lord, and you shall not leave the land to offend that the Lord your God is about to give you in a state. What? Go ahead, David. When a man will take a new wife, he shall not go out in the army and not go along with it for any matter. He shall be free at his house for one year, and he shall make his wife whom he has taken happy. One shall not take a mill or an upper millstone as security because it's taking one's life as security. When a man will be found stealing a person from among his brothers, from the children of Israel, so that he will get a profit through him and sell him, that sh thief shall die. So shall you burn away what is bad from among you. Be watchful with the plague of leprosy, to be very watchful, and do according to everything that the Levite priests will instruct you. You shall be watchful to do according to what I command them. Remember what Hashem your God did to Miriam on the way when you were coming out of Egypt. When you'll make a loan of anything to your neighbor, you shall not come into his house to get his pledge. You shall stand outside his house, and the man to whom you are lending shall bring the pledge outside to you. And if he is a poor man, you shall not lie down with his pledge. You shall give him back the pledge to him as the sun sets, and he'll lie down with his clothing, and he'll bless you, and you'll have virtue in front of Hashem, your God. Thank you so much, both of you. Paul, would you like to read a little bit, beginning at verse 14? Yeah, thank you, Rabbi. You shall not cheat a poor or destitute hired person among your brethren, or a proselyte who is in your land, or one who is in your cities. On that day shall you pay his hire. The sun shall not set upon him, for he is poor, and his life depends on it. Let him not call out against you to Hashem, for it shall be a sin in you. Fathers shall not be put to death because of sons, and sons shall not be put to death because of fathers. A man should be put to death for his own sin. You shall not pervert the judgment of a proselyte or orphan, and you shall not take the garment of a widow as a pledge. You shall remember that you were a slave in Egypt, and Hashem your God redeemed you from there. Therefore, I command you to do this thing. When you reap your harvest in your field, and you forget a bundle in the field, you shall not turn back to take it. It shall be for the proselyte the orphan, and the widow, so that Hashem your God will bless you in all your handiwork. When you beat your olive tree, do not remove all the splendor behind you. It shall be for the proselyte, the orphan, and the widow. When you harvest your vineyard, you shall not glean behind you. Now, it shall be for the proselyte, the orphan, and the widow. You shall remember that you are a slave in the land of Egypt. Therefore, I command you to do this thing. Thank, thank you so much, Paul. Richard, would you like to read a little bit at the start of chapter 25? Yes, thank you, Rabbi. When there is a dispute between men and they go to the law and a decision is rendered declaring the one is the right and the other in the wrong, if the guilty one is to be flogged, the magistrate shall have him lie down and be given lashes in his presence by count as his guilt warrants. He may be given up to 40 lashes, but no more, lest being flogged further to excess, your brother be degraded before your eyes. You shall not muzzle an ox while it is threshing. When brothers dwell together and one of them dies and leaves no son, the wife of the deceased shall, be married, shall not be married to a stranger outside the family. Her husband's brother shall unite with her and take her as his wife, performing the lover's duty. The first chapter son that she bears... Five, I mean, verse 5 of chapter 20. The first son that she bears shall be accounted to the dead brother, 
that his name may not be blotted out in Israel. But if the man does not want to marry his brother's widow, his brother's widow shall appear before the elders in the gate and declare, my husband's brother refuses to establish a name in Israel for his brother. He will not perform the duty of a levir. The elders of this town shall then summon him and talk to him. If he insists saying, I do not choose to marry her, his brother's widow shall go up to him in the presence of the elders, pull the sandal off his foot, spit in his face, and make this declaration. Thus shall be done to the man who will not build up his brother's house. And he shall go in Israel by the name of the family of the unsandaled one. Thank you so much, Richard. Jay, would you like to read a little bit at the beginning of uh, verse 11 there? Thank you. If two men get into a fight with each other and the wife of one comes up to save her husband from his antagonist and puts out her hand and seizes him by his genitals, you shall cut off her hand, show no pity. You shall not have in your pouch alternate weights, larger and smaller. You shall not have in your house alternate measures, a larger and a smaller. You must have completely honest weights and completely honest measures. If you are to endure long on the soil that I know your God is giving you. For everyone who does those things, everyone who deals dishonestly is abhorrent to the Lord your God. Remember what Amalek did to you on your journey after you left Egypt. How, undeterred by fear of God, he surprised you on the march when you were famished and weary and cut down all the stragglers in your rear. Therefore, when Adonai your God grants you safety from all your enemies around you in the land that Adonai your God is going, giving you as a hereditary portion, you shall blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. Do not forget. Thank you so much. And thank you, everyone. That's our Torah portion for the week. If everyone could go on mute just for a, a few moments, I'd like to share with you a little bit of focused study that I prepared, and then we'll open it up for everyone to have an opportunity to share his or her observations and reflections and thoughts about this week's Torah portion. Well, this week's Torah portion, Kiditse, is uh, very unique. It is the Torah portion that contains the most laws of any Torah portion uh, in uh, the Chumash, in our Bible. In fact, it contains 74 uh, distinct, distinct uh, halakhic provisions, legal provisions. I was trying to keep track of, as we were reading through, uh, I was focusing on the word remember. And what struck me was the word remember wasn't used in connection with any of the legal provisions that were enunciated here. We didn't have uh, a provision of what we're supposed to do, and then the text would say, remember that. No. The only session, the only times I could record the word remembering being used had to do with things that happened. Uh, remember you were a slave. Remember what God did to Miriam. And then our Torah portion climaxes here at the end with remember what Amalek did to you on your journey. So I'd like to take a few moments to explore this notion about remembering, oh, and in particular, this remembering this incident with Amalek, and why is it so important to remember that? Uh, why an event that took place 40 years before is so important to remember? Why remembering it is so important uh, at this moment as the Israelites are about to cross over into the, the promised land. And exactly what does it mean to remember? Uh, so what I'd like to do is, uh, first of all, uh, focus on our verse from this Torah portion that uh, Jay just shared with us from the end of chapter 25. Remember, and the Hebrew there is a whore, what Amalek did to you on your journey. Blot out the remembrance of Amalek. And do not forget. So exactly what was that incident 
that event that the Israelites are, are supposed to remember. Well, uh, fortunately, in case we've forgotten, we have a book that we, we can turn back the pages of and, and see exactly what it's referring to. So if you'd like to, you can turn back it in uh, book of Exodus chapter 17. And there we read that Amalek came out and fought with Israel at Rephidim. And then Moses said to Joshua, pick some men for us, go out and do battle with Amalek. And immediately before that verse about remembering uh, about Amalek coming out and fighting with Israel, the very previous verse, verse 17, uh, verse seven in chapter 17 of the book of Exodus says this, the place where the Israelites were was named Massa and Meribah because the Israelites quarreled and because they tried God saying, is God among us or not? And then immediately after that, it says, Amalek came and fought with Israel at Rephidim. So I like to focus a little bit on this uh, notion about asking this question, is God among us or not? So there's inquiry, a kind of a doubt, which is based on a lack of knowledge or perhaps some conflicting evidence. And then there's irrational doubt, which defies reason, overwhelming evidence, logical argument. And our tradition is going to read into this incident at Rephidim a kind of irrational doubt, because let's, re let's recall where, what has just happened for the Israelites. This is just two months uh, out of uh, leaving Egypt. So these people have just experienced uh, the, the wonders of the 10 plagues that were inflicted upon Egypt. They experienced the collapse of the mightiest empire in the world at the time, the surrender of, of Egypt. They witnessed the splitting of the sea. They experienced manna falling from heaven. And then they experienced uh, some lack of water and immediately they say, is God among us or not? So tradition reads into this, this kind of, despite all that they've experienced, despite all that they've seen, despite all the contrary evidence uh, before them, still they have this doubt, this irrational doubt about God's presence among them. And so uh, we're going to take a look at a midrash that explores what happens when there is this kind of irrational doubt that consumes a people. So this is number four in our study sheet, and it's from Midrash Tanhuma. To what is the incident of Amalek comparable? To a boiling tub of water which no creature was able to enter. Along came one evildoer and jumped into it. Although he was burned, he cooled it for the others. So too, when Israel came out of Egypt and God split the sea before them and drowned the Egyptians within it, the fear of the Israelites fell upon all the nations. When Amalek came and challenged the Israelites, although he received his due from them, he cooled the awe of the nations of the world for them. So this, the Midrash is telling us that even though Amalek met his fate and, and was defeated, his complete rejection uh, and defiance of all that has transpired uh, allowed other nations to say, hmm, maybe they're not as tough as we think they are. Maybe they're not as well protected by God as we think they might be. So there are these consequences to the, the doubt that the Israelites were experiencing kind of begins to uh, embolden their enemies and undermine themselves as well. 
So this notion about uh, cooling off, which the Midrash refers to, it has a, a linguistic uh, hook to it, if you will. If you want to, if you have the study sheet, you'd like to turn it over, I'll show you what that is. So in number five, we now have a verse from uh, our Torah portion from Deuteronomy chapter 25, verse 18, which says, he, meaning Amalek, he encountered you along the way. And the Hebrew there for encountered you is karcha, along the way, baderech. So the, the verb to encounter uh, consists of the shorash, the root kara. Interestingly enough, the word kara in Hebrew also means cold. Comes from the Hebrew word, Hebrew verb kara. So that allows the playfulness of the Midrash to say, ah, what's really happening here is it's not just Amalek encountered Israel, that Amalek had a cooling effect on the awe, the fiery awe, if you will, that the Israelites had been experiencing up to that, up to that moment. And then in number six, we have a little bit more playfulness, and this is in terms of gematria, which is the numerical value uh, of Hebrew words. So the numerical value for Amalek is 240. The numerical value for the Hebrew word safek, which means doubt, is also 240. So here we are in this little bit of an, of an interpretive set of uh, of rules, uh, playfulness, if you will, associating, identify Amalek with a notion of doubt. And so what we're going to now con conclude this part of our study with is taking this notion of Amalek as not just being an external force, but Amalek also being an internal force within each one of us. And I'd like to move on to a quote from Leon Wieselt here, uh, who is commenting on one of the great works in, in, uh, by Yosef Yerushalmi, who wrote a book called Zahor, which is kind of the key word that we're looking at here, Zahor, remember. So Yo Yosef Yerushalmi wrote this very uh, profound, influential, and short book called Zahor, Jewish History and Jewish Memory. And in that book, Yerushalmi makes a distinction between history, which seeks to uh, delineate events as they have happened in, in, in terms of modern scientific accounting of events that we call modern sense of history, and memory, which he says is something that's Beyond the, the recounting of events, it's something that is carried in people's hearts and souls through their stories and, and their songs and, and, and in what they tell one another. So this is what Leon Wiesel here nicely uh, summarizes about Yerush Yosef Yerushalmi's book. He writes, history, oh, and by the way, in number seven, if you have the study sheet, there's a lovely, lovely typo that I made, which I'm very proud of, okay? So number seven says, history involves critical, and it should say detachment. History involves critical detachment. Memory involves a deep immediacy. So Wieseltier is kind of telling us, helping us understand what Yerushalmi is trying to point out to us, which is history on the one hand is a recounting from some degree of detachment as detached observers, things that have happened. Memory, however, is a recounting of things that are deeply personal to us, some things that in, in which that we ourselves are somehow engaged in, involved in. This distinction between history and memory is something that we are encouraged to enact every year at our Passover Seder. And indeed, number eight, I have a quote from our Passover Haggadah. In every generation, 
one must see oneself as if he or she personally came out of Mitzrayim. In other words, it's a failure of the Seder if all we do is recount an event that happened to others in another time long, long ago. What's important is to experience them as if we are participants in this journey, as if we ourselves are engaged in this process of traveling from slavery to freedom, from narrowness to expanse. And indeed, uh, there's a Hasidic teaching that uh, takes this word Mitzrayim, which is the word that's used for Egypt, and which means a narrow constrained place, and says Mitzrayim, Mitzrayim means narrowness within us. There is actually a physical, a physical replication of that narrowness here, the neck. In the Hasidic teaching, it is this that is the narrowness. Why? Because it is between the heart and the head. And within this Hasidic teaching, uh, what's important is to try and leave behind the, the dominance of the heart, which this teaching sees as full of ego, uh, urges, uh, strong desires, subjectivity. And it's important to go from there up to here, where we have the capacity to engage in some reflection, some deeper understanding, some sense of control, and some sense of choice, and not leaving things merely up to our urges. So this Mitzrayim is what each of us has to cross over in order to be truly free. So tying some of this uh, together, Amalek in this sense uh, represents that kind of disregard of logic, that disregard of rational argument, that disregard of evidence. And Amalek, if you will, is a sense of disregard of evidence becomes cynicism, becomes denialism. And what's the response? How does one overcome Amalek? Zahor, to remember. And what are we remembering? Not something that happened outside of us. Zahor means to reawaken our sense of awe. What we experience, if you will, as the Israelites seeing the plagues, seeing the conquest of Egypt, seeing the splitting of the sea, seeing and experiencing manna falling from heaven. And I'd like to share with you these, these words from Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel, who says, awe enables us to perceive in the world imitations of the divine, to feel in the rush of the passing, the stillness of the eternal. So Zahor is a recapturing of the sense of awe that overcomes the cynicism, that overcomes the denialism, that overcomes the disregard, that overcomes the doubt, that overcomes the force that seeks to cool, if you will, our ardor of moving forward. To I'd like to end by turning to an artist, and that is Vincent Van Gogh. And Vincent van Gogh, who, as you know, was contended with many internal conflicts and, and demons, if you will, in his life, he wrote this. He said, if you hear a voice within you say, you cannot paint, then by all means paint, and that voice will be silenced. When I read that, I thought of one of the great Hasidic teachers, Rabbi Nachman of Braslav, uh, who said, 
if you think you can do harm, know that you can do good things. If you think that you're able to cause pain and suffering, know that you're capable of doing healing as well. Uh, Rabbi Nachman may have been one of the antecedents to what today we might call cognitive behavioral theory, which is if you act in a certain way, you can, you can make yourself be that way. So if someone's, if a voice within you says, you, you don't know how to paint, that's when you go ahead and paint and you'll be able to recapture that gift within you and, and you'll be able to manifest it. So the artist that we have on the front is Marc Chagall. And this is a lithograph he did of Moses blessing Joshua at Rephidim. And if you remember, Rephidim is where we said this incident happened with, with Amalek. And so Moses is blessing uh, Joshua, saying, now go forth and defeat Amalek. So if you will, if Amalek represents that kind of doubt, that irrational doubt that cools our own sense of awe, then Joshua is the one who represents the force that's capable of overcoming Amalek. Perhaps we call him Zahor. And Joshua, as you know from our narrative story, is the one who takes us over into the promised land. So with that, I'd like to open it up and hear your thoughts, reflections, your provocations, uh, your observations, your questions about the, from this week's Torah portion. If you'd like to raise your hand, I'd love to call upon you. Let's see, David? Uh, David, Susan, did you have your hand up? And go ahead and unmute, unmute uh, David Phillips. Thank you. David, you have to unmute. There you go. Sorry, uh, the shortcut didn't work. Um, I find the Chacal really disturbing. It looks like Moses has horns, he's painted in red. He looks like a devil. Yeah, tell me some more about that. And uh, I've been glancing at it out of the corner of my eye for the last half an hour and struggling for a connection. Joshua has a has is showing two hands, one of which appears to be either touching or holding an odd object. It maybe looks like one of the I've forgotten the term, but one of one of the the axles, one of the the rods that's used to roll up a scroll. And there's a really red sun with, to me, what looks like a hairpin through it and blood spurting out of it. I guess I just very disturbed. I'm not able to abstract it. Okay, uh, I'm fascinated. Would someone else like to respond to the Chagall piece in particular, Richard? Well, I studied in England at one time and it was a statue of Moses on the side of a building with these bulbs coming out of his head. And I inquired as to the pastor of the church. And he said, no, 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 no. Those are not horns. Those are rays of light. I understand that midrash or not midrash. That's an actually, there was an ancient Christian mistranslation of the Hebrew of a word that means glowing or light emanating of, out of his face is horns coming out of his face. I'm a little bit shocked to see it coming from Mark Chagall. Okay, let me, others want to respond to the Chagall piece in particular. Uh, let me, uh, Steve or Sherry, did you want to respond to the Chagall piece or, and then we'll get back to some other issues as well? No, I, I actually, it was, it was a different one. I not the Chagall piece. I had had my hand up before 
Okay. Because I'm reading, I'm reading a book called I Want You to Know We're Still Here. And there's, there's a piece where it talks about uh, memory. And I just wanted to share that. But Great. That we'll, we'll get back like, to the memory piece in just a second. Uh, Dave Lebb, did you want to talk about the Chagall piece? Uh, yeah, I'm looking at it uh, closely. And uh, Moses looks like he's uh, cross-eyed. <laughs> okay. Careful, right? All right. Let me add other Cheryl about the Chagall piece. Go ahead and unmute and share with us. He actually sort of looks like a fawn. Like a what? Fawn, F-A-U-N. Fawn. Okay. Or a you know a Greek um, satyr. Yeah, satyr. Um, it's very. It is disturbing. I. I had noticed the horns as well um, and was going to comment on it, but he feels strongly, I think, as David. Um, but it is, it's very disturbing. Let me ask you this. Why do you find it disturbing? Let me ask both you and David, why do you find it disturbing? Because having horns is one of the things that I personally was asked by people who didn't know Jews and they asked me, where are my horns? And so I've had personal experience with people taking that error and running with it. Um, and so I think maybe I'm particularly sensitive to it. Okay. And, and David, back to you. Tell me why you're so disturbed by it. Well, uh, the, there's that, the, the, this anti-Semitic trope. There's the the horn and the red uh, clothing uh, implies in my experience, the devil or evil or somebody's doing harm. And then um, yeah, I, I, I so it's 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 shocking and disturbing that if it was titled something else besides Moses and Joshua Rephidim, I would I would picture a whole different story, and I'm not able to connect it to the story of Moses and Joshua at Rephidim. Okay. I, I'm not getting. I mean, if it says anything to me, it's that that this green blue good guy is is being um having a laying on of hands is that transmits a, some sort of woo woo spiritual something down into him um and then he's going to go out and and go to battle so that I, I, that's suddenly the only connection that makes any sense to me is the, that the spiritual power that Joshua sent out with to defeat the, uh, the Amalek with is comes from a devilish source. I think I'm not as upset as David because I see the red as a color of celebration and power and not through the iconic iconography of Christian um, belief that it would be a devil. I just saw the, the fondness of it and and the horn thing. That I think that's why it doesn't. I'm not as upset as David. It's just the horn thing. Okay. Well, the red is very blood colored and it's and it's splotchy in a bloody sort of way. As a costumer and a costume historian, I can tell you that red was the color of power. It was very hard to get red. It's a very difficult dye to do with natural dyes. And it is a power color, not not a. If they put the devil in red, it was because he was powerful. So let me just go to Richard, and then I'll say one thing about the Chagall painting, and then we'll uh, pick up some other comments about some other issues as well. So Richard, yes, about the Chagall painting, uh, I don't like having the idea of horns tossed back in there. This is light coming down. He is in touch with God. He's our prophet. And this red is a power color, and it also is the power of co color of blood. But what I want to call attention to is how uh, 
clearly the left hand is outlined and the right hand is more uh, passive. And the eyebrows are different. The two sides of his, uh, of his brain are dealt differently. One is open and the other is, there's a scowl to it. And that's the left side, the so-called evil side. And to go to war, to kill people, uh, involves the integration of both power and compassion. And this is what Moses has trying to learn from God to offer us. So uh, I think that Chagall was uh, not just doing a caricature. Thank you. So I'll, just one comment about Chagall, then we'll open it up for some, some other issues that people saw in this week's story portion is one of the figures that Chagall used quite extensively and incorporated into a lot of his works is that of Jesus on a cross, the crucifixion. And he viewed Jesus as the paradigmatic the Jewish martyr, if you will. So it, it may be that maybe Chagall was seeking to incorporate and in, effect, in a sense, re-articulate or repurpose uh, some Christian symbols in try, as a way to try and tell a Jewish story and perhaps even to expand his audience. Uh, I'm not really sure, but uh, thank you uh, both uh, David and, and Cheryl in particular for, for raising the issues of, about uh, the Chagall piece and, and how provocative it was for you. So let me, let me call upon people who have some other thoughts. I know, uh, let's see, uh, Steve, uh, Sherry, you wanted to share with us about a book that you just read. Yeah, I'm, I'm still reading it. Uh, it's by Esther uh, Safran Foyer, I think I'm pronouncing it correctly. I want you to know we're still here. And it's about, it's another Holocaust book, um, but it talks and, and it's, it deals with, um, she was in a displaced persons camp and she, she set out to try to find out what happened to uh, her mother's family and her father's family. But um, all of this, this sort of reminds me of something that's in the beginning of the book. It has been said that Jews are a, an, his, an ahistorical people concerned more with memory than history. A curious fact, there is no word in he, the Hebrew language that precisely connotes history. Zacharon and Zahor use, used in its stead translate to memory. The word for history in modern Hebrew is lifted from the English word, which was originally lifted from the Greek historia. History is public, memory is personal. It is about stories and select experiences. History is the end of something, memory is the beginning of something. And then it goes on to talk about Jews have six senses, touch, taste, sight, smell, hearing, and memory. I just, it just seemed like it was, it fit in well with today's lesson. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you so much. Tell us again the name of the book. Um, I want you to know we're still here. We're re it is the, um, it's the selection for um, Beth Israel this month for our book club. Thank you so much for sharing it with us. Thank you. Okay. Welcome. Uh, Jay, Isaac, would you like to, to share something? If I may uh, have the liberty of going back to a Amalek, Rabbi, in chapter 17, uh, this doesn't happen in isolation. Uh, in 17, which is one of the shortest chapters I think I've seen, Moses is in conflict. These people are all over his butt or his head or anything. And they're saying, we don't have water. What's going to happen to us? Why did you bring us here? So Moses is being tormented by these people. He cried out to God, what shall I do with this people? Before long, they will be stoning me. So, uh, yeah, he, he says, pass before him and, and strike a rock and then take this rod and go out and fight these people. I think what, what his, what his uh, Joshua has there, it's, although it's very short, although he may be sitting on a very high stump, is that rod that Moses is going to be carrying. So uh, I think Moses is, is uh, as in many places in our uh, collective uh, uh, storytelling here, he's in a conundrum inside of an enigma, inside of a uh, conflict, inside of everything else. So uh, he's dealing with, with, with quite an onslaught of different uh, uh, demands and emotions. And, uh, uh, and he's not really doing this by committee. I think he's, uh, 
kind of doing it on the fly with this uh, voice that he hears or these things. Now, the other thing that I looked at with Chagall and knowing that Mark Chagall definitely uh, knew of the Kranayim, is that the word in Hebrew? Kranayim, yeah, yeah. the uh, the eminence of, uh, of light. Rabbi, is that? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. I remember that from Hebrew school, for, for God's sakes, from Hebrew school. I, I just think that uh, he had just gotten his hair done that day. And, and this is a hairstyle. Uh, that's my interpretation, just okay. a joke. But, but if you think about it, uh, he really, and look at, look at this many thousands, hundreds of years later, and the entire diverse population among us, what discussion this evokes. It's just, I can't think of anything else that can do this. That's it. So thank you, Jay. Let me just uh, pick up on something that you reminded me of, which is the, going back to the incident at Refidim. And he is instructed, as you pointed out, to take the, the, the rod, to, to strike it, to bring out water. And then we get to the incident about Amalek. And if you remember, after Moses sends out Joshua, he then, Moses sits on a rock, and it says that he, when he raised his hands, uh, the Israelites prevailed. When his hands lowered, uh, the Israelites were being defeated. And so Aaron and Hur come along and they raise up Moses' hands so that the Israelites would prevail. So our commentators point out with Moses, when Moses was raising his hands, it meant he didn't have his rod in his hand. They were open, bare hands. So the, the teaching there is that the Israelites are, are able to overcome Rephidim, not so much through the miracle and the intervention of God, but through their own power, which is represented by the absence of that staff and Moses having his open hands and being raised up uh, by Hor and Aaron. So thank you for reminding me of, of that part of our, of our story. Uh, and then Mark Thompson. Thank you, Rabbi. <clears throat> I'd like to explore a little bit this notion of awe um, and relate it to your item number seven in the study sheet. I thought that was really fascinating. And I, I really wanted to explore what, what is the source of awe? Where does that come from? Does it come from the more rational part of us? I don't think so. I think it comes more from our memories, which is attached to our heart. So I wanted to explore that a little bit further because I was a little confused about your explanation of awe. It seemed to me that awe comes from uh, memory and it comes from um, a very deep experience that we have that's experienced at least symbolically from the heart, not so much rationally. Just thought maybe we could explore that a little bit. Okay. Uh, let me ask Richard Kramer, do you want to say something about awe? I think awe is when you're dumbfounded by something. It's so beautiful or so horrific. The Holocaust was awesome. It evokes awe. How can that happen? In the same way, we look out in the morning and what an awesomely beautiful day. And I want to tie this to uh, the business about uh, Amalek. Uh, his his memory has been blotted out from under heaven. Don't forget. What? <laughs> Don't forget that his memory has been blotted out. It reminds me of the story about Immanuel Kant who had a servant named Lampa who was always messing up, dropping things and so forth. And it just irritated Kant and he was obsessed with it. And he made a note to himself, must remember to forget Lampa. <laughs> and I think about awe as you know, we're, we're faced with it. The existential situation is in our face in Afghanistan, in, uh, in the pandemic, in all that's going on. Climate change, it's just coming down. It's awesome. And how can we deal with this is by forgetting it. Don't get attached to those cynical feelings, but enjoy the day. Rejoice in the day that we're here. Enjoy in the positive awe. Latch on to the affirmative, eliminate the negative, and don't mess with Mr. In-Between. <laughs> um, so I, I thank you, Richard. And I, I think also that 
awe is, uh, if you will, super rational. It, it, it goes beyond the rational. Yes. And, and it is not merely in, in terms of the description that I was providing you about um, the heart and the head, where in that setting, the heart represents urges and yearnings and un, uh, unmodified uh, desires, if you will. And Oops. so a sense of awe doesn't have, really have anything to do with either one of those. Awe, awe is something that's buried deep within us from primal experiences that, that we have about life. And I just want to say that the definition of awe, of Miriam Webster, awe's definition is an emotion variously combining dread, veneration, and wonder. Yeah. So beginning of wisdom is awe of the Lord. Okay. So, thank you. Uh, I'm gonna go. I want to give you a, a chance, Mark, if you'd like to. To either fill in, respond, or have some more. Oh help. yeah, no, I, I I love the explanation, both of you. Um, I guess I was thinking of the Hebrew word uh, for fear, pachad, which is sometimes used as a substitute for the word awe. And it's good to hear the other side of it. And that's how I think of awe: is it has both positive and negative connotations. Um, but I still feel that it that the the aspect of being awe inspired is a function more of memory and presence as opposed to one of being uh, detached uh, rationally. Yes, thank you. That's my point. It's a sense of wonder, which is I yeah. think what Heschel also is trying to get us to re-experience that childlike sense of wonder, which yeah. too much rationalization, too much re reason has kind of uh, shamed us from, from experiencing. So, Cheryl, yeah, the other point, I, the other thing I just, is that I, I felt that that in a way, um, this item number seven, it, it diminishes the importance of history. I think both history and memory are equally uh, important. Thank you. All right. Uh, I have a question, Rabbi. Did the ancient Israelites see the head as the home of reason and the heart as the home of emotion? Because those are... Uh, those are our, our not necessary um, right. through every culture. There's different uh, to, there's different kind of imaging uh, imaging of, of that. And actually, in some of the uh, texts, you'll see heart is a source of wisdom. Okay. All right. uh, and others would like to share something. Uh, and Susan, and then we will uh, conclude. Thank you. Go ahead, Susan. So I'm doing a jigsaw puzzle and it's starry, starry night. So I've been thinking a lot Van, about Van, Van Gogh. Gogh. And um, it's also the hardest jigsaw puzzle I've ever done, but um, that's neither here nor there. Um, and so I was researching a little bit about Van Gogh and apparently there's some people that just recently had started doing a biography of him. And one, two of the things they said that really struck me was one, that there's reason to believe he didn't cut off his own ear, that Gauguin actually, who was an accomplished swordsman, uh, cut it off when they were fighting. And two, he supposedly killed himself and that um, it's believed that it might have been a young boy that accidentally shot him because he, if he had been there isn't any evidence of the gun where he was supposed to have done it, it was too far for him to have made it back to this sanitarium himself there's a bunch of things that are contradictory and they're and they're suggesting that he actually didn't shoot himself so it's interesting because we've always portrayed him as somebody that was so almost suicidal or masochistic or self-hating yeah. at least that's one and, and all of a sudden, there's these other images, <clears throat> and along with what you said, the, the quote in your on your sheet made me think of that. Thank you. Let me let me conclude by uh, wrapping it up with Vincent Van Gogh. It, it remains unknown and a mystery. 
uh, the conclusion to Vincent van Gogh's life. I do highly recommend, if you haven't already seen it, to see the movie Loving Vincent, which is, first of all, a uh, aesthetically a beautiful film because each uh, frame uh, is a hand-painted frame in the style of Vincent van Gogh. And it's, it's a story, at least from this perspective, of the final days of Vincent van Gogh. But as we know, Vincent van Gogh uh, didn't sell a, a single work during his lifetime. And yet he continued to paint. And, and that to me is in a sense what this Torah portion is about, which is the refusal to, to give in to a corrosive self-doubt. The people of Israel, if they're gonna cross over into the promised land, they can't carry with them the level of doubt that they had with them at Rephidim. They need to in, they need to purge that bit of Mitzrayim, that bit of Egypt from themselves if they're going to cross over into a land of promise and create a place of responsibility and freedom and mutual accountability. So Vincent van Gogh, if you will, he could have easily said, no one's buying my painting. What's the point of painting? The point of painting is because that's who he was. To not paint would be to deny who he was and to refuse to express what was motivating his whole life. So the notion of overcoming doubt, especially about oneself, is what's important if we're going to become truly fully developed free and responsible human beings. So thank you all very much for creating that kind of community on a, a weekly and, and daily basis where we, in a sense, serve as Aaron and Hor, holding up one another's arms so that we can overcome the sense of doubt that Amalek represents. God bless you all. Look forward to our regathering. Be well, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi. Good night. Thank you, Thank you all. Good night. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, uh... Thank you.